It is my honor to be able to introduce writer and professional podcaster Linda Holmes. Linda is a popular culture correspondent for NPR and the host of the podcast Pop Culture Happy Hour. She also appears regularly on other NPR radio shows such as Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. Along with writing for NPR, uh, <laughs> Linda's writing has been featured in New York Magazine, TV Guide, and sites such as Television Without Pity, yeah. Vulture.com, and MSNBC. Linda Holmes... <laughs> Uh, you may have seen, if you're a uh, PNP uh, regular, you might have seen Linda Holmes moderating some of her events in the past. But this is really cool because this is her fiction debut. Yeah. The book is titled Evie Drake Starts Over, and it tells the story of recently widowed Evelith Evie Drake who has turned into a recluse, rarely leaving her large home in small town Calcasset, Maine. Things change, however, when Evie agrees to fill the empty apartment at the back of her house with a new tenant, former baseball star Dean Tenney, who is recovering from the fallout of a stalled pitching career. This is a story of two people trying their very best to get things right, but dealing with the messiness and complications of love and life along the way. Kirk's Review calls Evie Drake Starts Over, quote, a warm and lovely romance, perfect for readers of Rainbow Rowell and Louise Miller. Tonight, Linda Holmes will be, jo will be joined in conversation with Barry Hardiman, <laughs> senior editor, who is the senior editor at NPR's Weekend Edition and frequent panelist for Pop Culture Happy Hour. Everyone, please join me in welcoming to the podium Linda Holmes and Barry Hardiman. Did I turn it off? Yeah. I think I turned it off. No, no, no. I turned mine off. You led you... me down the garden path. I did. I did. You have to not have the orange light on. So I think now you're on. All right. There we go. Yeah. Cool, Yay. cool, cool. Okay. This we is the real are beginning. audio professional. <laughs> I'm still back on a form and orderly line. That means... <laughs> That's like... Do it. No mobs, please. <laughs> Form an orderly line. Just be calm, guys, really. It's a very weird, this is a very weird feeling, so I'm still kind of getting used to it. Nice. Well, Linda. Barry. You wrote a book. I did. I did. I, I don't know if I'm going to stand for you being introduced as anything other than a writer these days, because my God. Yeah. I tell you. It's Jack amazing. of all trades, but the writing. Um, anyway. I'm completely shocked. I'm still shocked. Let's talk about this book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I loved this book because that's what we're here for. We guys would have been really surprised if I was we like, could talk about, "Let's talk about interior design." Yeah. I am over the drapes. Barry just wrote a really, <laughs> Barry just wrote a really lovely piece about Judith Krantz for NPR, so we could talk about that. Well, romance is going to come up in this conversation, yeah, young lady. True. It's true. So, it's true. You know, don't worry, we're going to go there. It's true. But let's start with um, tell us a little bit about. I mean, we had a, yeah. you know, we've read. Let, ta let's tell everybody what they're in for, which is sure. a real delight. So I don't actually say that for all the things. Sometimes I just say, <laughs> tell me about your T book. Tell me about your book. <laughs> Which has pages. Um, <laughs> your eyes will fall on them. So the book, as, as was described, um, it has a, a kind of a love story, uh, a potential love story between Evie and Dean, this baseball player who moves into her house. It also is a very uh, important friendship story uh, mm -hmm. um, between her and her best friend, who's a, a guy... Um, who's a single dad, and it also has a story of sort of her and her family, her her parents. She was also raised by a single dad, and um, but also the town that she lives with, and it lives in, uh, in lives with. Well, oh, there's yeah, we can go the there town too. that she, <laughs> the town that People she lives in, which is if you've ever been to Maine, there's a, a section of Maine. Um, that they, that's referred to as Midcoast, and it's it's like an hour north of Portland-ish, and it's um, Camden and Rockland, and this whole area where it's just a lot of water and lobster boats, and it's so pretty and nice, and it's a great combination of like it's a, it's touristy, but it's also working. It's it's still like they're still like working towns. Um, I love it up there. My family went there when I was uh, a, a kid, and then we went back um, when we were adults and my sister's kids were little. We all went back together. Um, 
and it's just a very, very special place to me. So the, the setting was a big deal too. So there's sort of a love story and a friendship story. And because it's me and I can't not, there's a lot of kind of people yapping back and forth, having fun banter because it's my favorite thing. And mm-hmm. why not put mm-hmm. your favorite thing in your book? So. Is the house real? Is the house, ha- because it's such a lovely description. I do feel house, that I, if I encountered it, I would recognize it. There are sort of it. two main houses in the book. Right. There's a oh. house that, um, there's a house that, that she lives in at the opening of the book. And then there's another house that kind of shows up late in the book. Mm-hmm. The house that shows up late in the book is mostly a real house. Oh, That's the okay. one of the houses that we stayed in. Uh when I was a kid. So the description of the house is, with a little bit of, of, of license, is very much what the house was like when I stayed there as a kid. I think they've, I think they've, renovated and, and improved it. <laughs> um, I still sometimes you can actually still find it on like Airbnb and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and oh that's um, nice Verbo oh we should go whatever. anyway we should yeah, let's go that'll be fun okay let's see go. you guys. right now we'll be back later uh, so one of the things that I you know I as we've like talk about this book it's it is really a delight and so you're going to hear people say that a lot but it also there are some um, you know people are because it is so sort of deeply human filled with people behaving like themselves. I think one of the, you know, starting at the beginning of the book, you have a young widow who isn't that sad. And you describe, I think, this relationship with the husband, the, Mm -hmm. um, it is not a spoiler to say that, because I just said widow, I obviously. Right. (laughs) But it's not a spoiler to say that that there's a real level of emotional abuse in here, which I thought was so well told. Oh, thank you. The um, the setup for the book, and this is not a spoiler because it's in the prologue, but the um, the first thing that you learn in the book is that she's in the middle of trying to to leave her husband. She's packing. She's kind of gotten herself together. She's going to do it. Um, and right then she finds out that he's been in a car accident and he eventually dies. And so when I first started writing the book, I think I was thinking a lot about the fact that she felt really guilty mm-hmm. because she wasn't feeling exactly what people expected her to be feeling. Um, she felt like his parents and other people in their town were were mourning for him and she wasn't able to grieve the way she felt she should. But I think as I wrote the book, one of the things that I kind of figured out about her was that she's also very frustrated by the fact that this was – she felt – like it was important for her to leave under her own power. Mm-hmm. And because that away. can't happen, mm-hmm. she's then left with a, an unsatisfying, you know, finish to that story. And there's a moment where she kind of says, I think I would have really gone through with it. I think uh-huh. I was really going to leave. But you, you never know for absolutely sure. And she's kind of left with a very... Um, a very incomplete end to that story. So it's partly about her trying to figure out how to get past that thing that you never really get to to finish that story. And there are a lot of people, both you know, Evie is certainly, and also the 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 husband, you know, who are showing different faces to the, uh, you know. Right, like right. He's, it's one of those interesting things, like halfway through, I thought, would I have recognized, I think I would have, yeah. but would I have recognized what a shit, that she, what a, oh, wait, sorry, it's not actual air. It's good, <laughs> let me... Three, two, one. What a jerk <laughs> this guy was, you know, yeah. um, because it is that that sort of subtle undermining mm-hmm. and the way that it is um, sort of laid out is so. Um, but but what is so great is that the I that moment, which is really heartbreaking, where where Evie is, you know, sort of saying what I have is that you you believe that no matter what he, that she would have, I, I, you know, I I think you, or I did, that was my, my reading experience. I mean, I think it's important to her to believe that Mm -hmm. she would have. Right. I guess that's Um, better. Yeah. And I think that, that one of the things I wanted to put in the book was this sense that she, one of the reasons why she stayed. And one of the reasons why, one of the things that you learn in the book is that she hasn't really told anybody Mm -hmm. that her marriage is even her dearest friends right and she hadn't told anybody that she was getting ready to leave she figured I'll leave and then I'm going to call them and tell them that I've left and this is what happened and the reason part of the reason why she wasn't telling them was that it wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't sort of concrete enough that she knew how to explain here's why I'm so unhappy here's why he's so awful to me even though He's very well liked by other people. He's a very popular kind of doctor, young doctor, He's well a doctor. liked. He's he, they've both lived in their town for for um, many years, and they're kind of both 
local sort of beloved people because they live in a really small town. She doesn't. She didn't really know how to tell anybody. I'm so unhappy because she she didn't have a kind of a bruise that she could show mm-hmm. them and say, "Here's why I'm so unhappy." And so I think that's one of the things that made it really hard for her to quantify even to herself and therefore to other people why she was so unhappy. It's a. I think it's an important story because there are. I I really loved the way that you handle that because it is. It sometimes it's a bruise you can't see. Right. Um. But Evie is a is a good girl too. Evie is like a real. You know, she has done things. She's a she's right. a doer of of things right. in the right way. Right. And um. One and she's and she's also really, really funny. So one of the things I I really love about this novel is that you have a main character who is a lovely person who's trying to do things right. And she's fascinating. And we, I think, have often been exposed to characters that have to be not, and this is true for, I think, most of the people in the book, that everybody is making mistakes for the right reasons (laughs) or for reasons that we all understand. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think you know Scott Simon. <laughs> I, I've known him. I've, I've heard of him. Um, one of the things that we talked about when I talked to him about the book was um, that everybody in the book gets, has a certain number of moments of grace because it's it's the only kind of story I really care about is the kind where everybody is, is, is trying. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was important to me that she not be... Um, and this sounds, it's not, it's not because she was in an abusive relationship that she would be this way, but it was important to me that she not be a mope in the sense that she only had this one thing that she Mm -hmm. ever thought about or talked about. It was important to me that she not be one dimensional as a kind of a, a traumatized person because real people aren't like that. So it was important to me that she be somebody who could like tell a funny story or Skin have a care. funny There's idea. There's this amazing moment where she's getting, where she's like, yeah. I love Evie like getting ready when she's like well, putting on, like she's such yeah. a, like a person I recognize. Well, and that was an important, that was actually an important sequence to me because that's at a moment where she's sort of thinking about going out on a date for the first time. You know, she, the guy she married was her high school sweetheart. He's really the only relationship she's ever been in. So she's kind of trying to, to get, kind of revved up to go out on this date. And she, I, I really wanted, if you if you look closely at that passage, you don't learn a lot about what she looks like physically. Mm-hmm. Um, what you learn a lot about is how she's feeling about kind of trying to redevelop some relationship with her physical self, which she just hasn't thought about in a really long time. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about her kind of trying to figure out like, sort of going through those rituals and to some degree she enjoys them and to some yeah. degree she's sort of thinking, why Mystified. am I doing right. all these things? Right. Um, and then of course my favorite thing, and this is like a small punchline spoiler, but I'm going to tell you anyway. My favorite thing about it is that when, when the guy she's going out with sees her, he goes, Oh, you look cute. Cause yes. That's, yes. that to me is right. the, that's the, you know, you go through the two hours of preparation and then you get the like, you look cute. Like, right. it, it's like, I've you been, know. right. I've been like plucking these. Exactly. Like, yeah. And it's sort of that thing of like, you know, doesn't yeah. care that much yeah. probably, or it, doesn't know that he cares that much. About this. Right. But, anyway. li- but, li- but likes her so yeah, much. Sure. Yeah. 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 I like people who like each other. I don't like people. I don't like, I don't like love stories that revolve around like everybody. Hey, they hated each other until one day they didn't. Like, cause well, I don't. <laughs> Right. I don't have that experience no. very often with people. And there actually, are very few people that I'm close to platonically or romantically yeah. or anything where it's been like, I just could not stand this person when I met them. I thought they were such a jerk. I thought true. this guy was so arrogant. But then eventually we became friends one day. Right. We got caught in the rain and <laughs> right. it was the rain. It was the well, rain. Well, you really set us up for what a great relationship is coming because she already has this great friendship mm-hmm. with Andy. Yeah. And um, this is one of I feel I just one of the most um, j- exuberantly bantery, wonderful. I wanted to spend more time sitting with them. Yeah. In that, and the and this is the very this is the very beginning of the book, essentially, sure, yeah. when you're really sort of treated to this, and you really set this this friendship up as a kind of. Um, as a way to say, this is what these are the kind of relationships that that Evie can have, mm-hmm. and yeah. therefore, you know that when Dean enters, no matter how cute he is, and he's cute, um, 
that he's got a you know that that she has these people and her father and all of these, but in particular this like she it better come up to the standard of her platonic right, relationship. Sure, and I think she's. I think you also get a sense that she. This is the relationship she's been able to maintain. Mm-hmm. This is the relationship, other than family, other than basically her dad. This is the relationship she's been able to maintain and keep healthy. Um, she's become pretty isolated. She's kind of she's kind of become separated from most of her women friends, um, as I think sometimes happens in mm-hmm. unhappy um, yeah. relationships. Mm-hmm. And this is the relationship that she's managed to to hang on to and and nurture and keep healthy. And so it's very it's very precious and important to her. Mm-hmm. And you know, there was a point in the mm-hmm. editing process where one of the many people who was working on kind of reading versions of the book asked me whether I wanted to put a little more, I think the word was frisson into their kind of <laughs> friendship. The idea that there was a little bit more like was this uh was this developing into some kind of triangle situation? And I was immediately like, nope, <laughs> nope. Because I, I want to be able to write it that you can actually have that. You can have this kind yes. of relationship. It doesn't mean it doesn't have its particular challenges, but it doesn't mean that secretly there's, oh, there's all this frisson. <laughs> No frisson. I want well, it to be frisson free. And also it's great too that like this is a very romantic book, but it's also but the this friendship is also like a really central part of it. They're they're almost of equal weight to yes, me. Yes, that's the book. a they're, better they're, way. They're yes. Pretty much equally mm-hmm. important to me, the friendship story. The friendship story is the one that has, for example, a bigger fight. Right. Oh, um, that's the biggest a, fight mm-hmm. in the book is in the friendship story, not mm-hmm. in the love story. Mm-hmm. So it's it's they're they're equally important to me, and I think they're equally I hope they're equally sort of complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, so, yeah. And the, or there's a kind of, also, I feel like, especially like in that scene, in the fight, there's a, everybody who's watching it happen mm-hmm. is like, yeah. oh, this is a really important thing. Yeah. And they're really making some mistakes. Well, <laughs> like, it, we need to took, get this took shit me, together. It took me a while to realize that I had to tell that story from the from the perspective of one of the people not in the yes, fight. Yes, it's a very because clever. Because the people in the fight were both drunk. Mm-hmm. And so it's too hard for me, at least, it's too hard for me to write a scene from the standpoint of a drunk person. Mm-hmm. Because when drunk, I don't think I could describe anything very <laughs> accurately. Yeah. So it's like, in order to be drunk enough for this scene to happen, it, all that you would have from your point of view is like, and then I saw him and he was over there and it was really crazy. And so right. it's told from the standpoint of somebody else who's not actually a player in that in that fight. And But he recognizes the, the oh, yeah. depth of this. Oh, yeah. You know. It's bad. Right. Um, the, uh, the It's told from the point of view of Dean, who mm-hmm. is the... Um, the, the, the baseball player, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, that's a, that's some frisson. Now we're yeah, at the frisson yeah, portion yeah, of the uh, evening. Bears, I think you're very shimmy. Yeah. Is it's the, a little there's there's the some frisson. shimmy in there. Yeah. You are a sportsy lady. You enjoy the sports yeah. balls. I. <laughs> but I I mean, I mean truly like you more are than a, you do right. <laughs> <laughs> But what is so great? I mean, I am teasing a little bit, but you right, are sure. you know of what you speak. So let's talk about Dean, who is yeah. who a terrible thing has happened to. And yeah. I I feel like when I first picked up the book and I and I didn't understand the depth of it, and you yeah. write about it really well about what it is like to lose something. So so like this. um the yips is a term that originally came out of golf, and it happens to to you know guys with their putt will suddenly just go nutty. But in baseball, it tends to come up with people who suddenly, like, it's not that they lose the ability to be great all of a sudden. It's that they lose the ability to basically complete the functions of baseball um, in the position that they play. So, for example, the I the one that I think I became interested in first was Mackie Sasser, who was a catcher for the, the Mets. And, you know, the pitcher pitches. That's supposed to be the hard part. I, I did know that. Yeah. And, then, and then the catcher throws back to the pitcher. That's supposed to be the easy part. You can do that part in Little League. And Mackie Sasser lost the ability to throw back to the pitcher. It was almost like a physical um, manifestation of a, of a stammer. He would kind of tap the ball against the mitt. Weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And he used to, like, he would almost, um, you know, they go down into the crouch, the catcher, and he would fall over backwards trying to get his his arm to go back. It It is the weirdest thing he attributed it partly to a, a collision at the plate that had injured his ankles, so he had to, to, to crouch differently. 
Um, but also he wound up in therapy talking about whether it had something to do with trauma that he hadn't dealt with. Like, honestly, nobody really fully understands it. And my favorite story and the one that's the, and it, this one is in the book. When Chuck Knobloch was a second baseman for the Yankees, he completely lost the ability to throw from second to first. Um, my nephews can do that. They're both very good baseball players. They played baseball through high school. They can throw from second to first. Not as well as a major league player, but well enough not to throw into the stands, which is what he started to do. And on one occasion, threw into the stands, passed first base, and hit Keith Olbermann's mother. I love that. <laughs> With the baseball, which is a the kind of thing that if you made it up and put it in a book, they'd be like, all right. <laughs> but it is a true story. Keith Olbermann's Mother. Not I hit a sports guy, right. but I hit a sports guy's mom. <laughs> so I found this, as you can tell, I find this whole thing completely compelling because I think as a writer, you always have that fear. Mm -hmm. What if I just suddenly froze and I couldn't write anymore and I didn't know what to do and I never had another idea and everybody was watching me try to write and everybody was writing, you know, there was going to be a newspaper story the mm -hmm. next day that said, once again, she wrote not a word all day long. Um, how but she could suddenly throw be. a baseball. It was weird. Exactly. Like yeah. how difficult it would be to, to experience that kind of, of failure yeah. in public um, it, it, after being very successful. Yeah, they're, they're both experiencing a kind of this brokenness in different places. Like his is so public. Right, exactly. And nobody knows hers is a secret to exactly. almost everyone. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, You're so smart, Barry. Well, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> um, How did you get the this, this sports? I, I mean, one of the things that I love about this is that it, it's, it is so detailed in this I feel like yeah. the like you treat it you treat sports so much like it is and it is but the, it is part of your right your your world of pop culture and all the things and a way to examine humanity well so how did sports, the sports I mean, thing start sports to me Sporting. is sports to me is mostly mostly interesting as a uh, um it's not that I don't like to watch a great game but sports is is really interesting to me as a, a cultural kind mm -hmm. of product know, as, right. a, as a thing that people talk about and care about. Um, and I think baseball is, as I said, my nephews played baseball. Baseball is the professional sport I cared about when I was growing up. Um, and I think sports in that way, um, it's just, it, it's just to me an interesting thing to try to kind of get your head wrapped around. And I read, I read a lot of, I was gonna of ask you, yeah. baseball books. Yeah. I read, I read, um, uh, I, I read a couple different ones. I read a couple of books by people who have had the yips. Um, and I read a couple of um, sort of general books about pitching um, uh -huh. so that I wouldn't make obvious errors <laughs> about yeah. how pitching works. Um, so, yeah, I did a fair amount of reading. And at one point the book had a lot more kind of the history of the yips is this. Right. And the, it was one of those things where I think I had to write all of it and then my editor had to come along and be like, Okay. here's how much of it actually needs to be in the book versus here's the stuff that it's good that you wrote and it's good that you know, right. but it doesn't all have to be in the book. Right. Right. I feel like when I read the book, I was suddenly, I, I, there's so much of, there's enough, it feels so natural that now yeah. I do feel like kind of an expert on it. Right. And every totally. now and then when my son can't throw the ball, I'm like, Oh, you got the yips. Got the yips. <laughs> it's over. It's, it is a, yeah. it is a scary and weird, it is a scary and weird thing. Yeah. And, and I feel for everyone it's ever happened to. I, um, uh, there are a lot of there. Like I said, there are some the the, the two major um, knots that need to be untied are the Dean and um, and Evie knots. But there's also this um, really wonderful and just so I could I'm not I could I, I still feel emotional thinking about her relationship with her father. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I mean, this is one of these uh, these things where I found myself feeling it was very healing to read a from, you know, and I have a great dad, but in these ways of, of watching this relationship evolve. Yeah. And I know that you have two great parents that you love. Yeah. And, are, are, For sure. and I, For I sure. wondered again, I just wondered what it was like to write that relationship and, and how, because Evie's mom has run away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that is another sort of knot that she is trying right. to untie, especially right. in relationship to what's. Yeah, I definitely like, I, I felt like um, I felt like 
people sometimes say you don't read about a lot of single dads, and that's not quite true. You read about a lot of single dads, and you see movies and TV about a lot of single dads, but the mom has almost always died. Mm -hmm. So the idea is usually that the dad has had single dadhood thrust upon him and had no, had no right. choice and kind of is suffering through it in a noble fashion. And what I hadn't seen a lot of were stories where you had a single parent who became a single parent the way a lot of single parents actually do, which in Evie's case, right. it's true that her mom is a little bit more of an abrupt departure. Mm -hmm. But in the case of her best friend, it's much more of a kind of they got divorced and the mom mm -hmm. moved away in the same way that dads often move mm -hmm. away. And he's the one who winds up taking care of the kids. And so um, it really you'd be surprised how long it took me in this in writing this book to recognize the echoes between of the single her, and Andy between right. her her own story mm -hmm. and that naturally she would be drawn to this you know, his single dadhood would be something that she would kind of enjoy being a part of, being a part of sure. and kind of helping him out, recognize and a support for him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a lovely, uh, there are, there are a lot of really great men in this book, um, which, great men in this which book. is a sentence I, know, I don't I often know. say about <laughs> contemporary adult fiction. True. I know <laughs> um, a lot of great men though. So it, it makes sense. Right. But it was, I mean, that's like a lot. I mean, it was great to sort of put the book down and be like, well, that's where all the yeah. good guys are. Yeah. <laughs> They're in Maine. I'm just kidding. You all yeah. seem so nice. It's true. Um, it's true. But, uh, okay, now I have to ask you some stuff I'm really actually just dying to ask. Sure. How, the dialogue is so good. The banter is so good. And I know you are a bantery lady, And the, but yeah. your scene writing is so good. Did you just sit down and write? Is that How did how did that, you know, you watch a lot of stuff, I've right. heard. Right. Um, I mean, I think this is one of the things where I think it's just a matter of over time you you train your ear. Um, yeah. You know, in the same way that this is going to, this is, sounds really, in the same way that you would for music. You, no, it you doesn't. You train your ear thing. over time for what is pleasurable to you. And radio. And I think, oh, I do that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And I think... <laughs> I think that from listening to, from from watching many years of romantic comedies in television and film, mm -hmm. and a lot of times when I try to describe this kind of stuff, I fall back on um, TV and film mm -hmm. uh, as influences more than more than fiction. Um, but uh, you know, growing up watching like Nora Ephron movies, yes. and um, this feels what scary. I have spoken of as the the, the better Aaron Sorkin stuff. <laughs> Um, kind Ooh. of the more the, the the super delightful part of, of his stuff to me is that the, was there the was so much coldness in that, yeah. <laughs> but like the musicality of yeah. the dialogue it's so rhythmic and and wonderful and kind of looping in this way and there are like one or two places in the book where if you read it you'll be like well here's your Sorkin like mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of moment mm -hmm. um, but but they're like women talking That's yeah great. exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or it's just about like for what women care about but yeah it's like it's so. I mean, I actually, yeah. Fair, right, fair. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you said it, not me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a really, um, that is a thing that, that is probably the, the least kind of, um, uh, you know, work-like and uh -huh. more in the most instinctual. I believe that. Um, yeah. Just because it comes from, and also if you have a lot of really smart friends and you sit around trying to, trying to keep up with really smart conversations a lot, you you know you start to figure out what you think is a, is right. a if you say have a podcast a, right <laughs> right one yeah. to think mm -hmm. it's a really there's a lot there's a lot of that and it is also but you also there are some you know there's a description of um, crying in the shower in this book that I just yeah was I was like oh yeah well that's so what that is it's also true that you can find um, your observations asks. are very very sharp <laughs> so the fight in the book is is somewhat inspired by how it felt to me to have a real fight I once had. Mm. Um, uh, not with not with anyone you know. Oh, I, um, I wasn't. But uh, a real fight I once had. And you can actually find in my Twitter feed, there's a speed, there's a there was a tweet when I said um, something about crying in the shower, something about what's the, the shower cry, like which is the better cry, the shower cry or the car cry yeah. or something like that. And it was the morning after this fight and I had been crying in the shower. Mm -hmm. And so it's all like, those are the little things, like the book is not autobiographical, but a lot of those little things, it's like, oh yeah, crying in the shower, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that, which is a, like a weird 
weird thing to f- to think about is. But it's finally you know, observed. What a, t- what a terrible thing, but I'm going to hang on to that for it's, some right. writing purpose. But later. it's useful to people who have cried in the shower, I yeah. will say. So, yeah. yeah. No, I do. I really. Crying I, in the shower is great. It all just. Yeah. It That's true. Goes away. I mean, but the, the fact of that is yeah. just like, I'm going to probably, this is going to depuff yeah. by the time yeah. I've drive. Yeah. It all <laughs> just right. goes away. Anyway. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question that I know that everyone else wants sure. to. Um, uh, I, again, I know, I feel like I keep saying this, but I do think it's important um, to note that I haven't read a lot of books where really literally, even maybe Tim, but. He does still sit. The husband. Like a shit. He's the husband. Uh, yeah, but um, is really trying to do the right thing, and I, you know, you have watched. You, I feel like, have presided over a moment in pop culture where we, there have been. It's like the age of the the anti hero of sure, the the, sure. the antagonists and the you know, and it's a in it. There is a real relief in seeing. Because it, it it feels like less of a fantasy than say Breaking Bad. Do you know not a fantasy? Do you know what I mean? Like no, it feels I more do. like I do. Oh, this is the real world. Yeah, I mean, I think that in real life, um, you know, full resolutions. And I, I'm speaking here about kind of personal stuff and not kind of broader political stuff. Oh, sure. But it, it, in your personal life, I find um, perfectly satisfying solutions to to big things. Are, are pretty rare, mm-hmm. um, but small moments in which you encounter kindness or um, someone is really decent to you or you learn something great, those things are actually pretty common. <laughs> and, and there's a sense, I think, that they're not interesting enough to be in fiction. And so to me, I that's the stuff that I think is the most interesting. And, and honestly, with this book... You know, I went back and forth for many years about what would be a novel that I could actually write and mm-hmm. finish. And I really wound up going with what did I what would I want to read? Mm-hmm. I mean, that I think it was the most rather than trying to think about like what is the market for fiction right now? <laughs> what is the zeitgeist? Like that you can't. For one thing, I started writing it in 2012, so it's a good thing I wasn't trying to catch the zeitgeist. Um <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I think for me, it was just a matter of trying to find something that I wanted to write and I am that I wanted to read. And I am more interested in books about decency and the, it's, it's difficulties and it's limitations than I am in sort of, you know, what I have often called get a load of these assholes, fiction, <laughs> <laughs> which just doesn't interest me that much. Well, it's a, um, I, I very much appreciated that it was what I wanted to read. Thank you, Barry. So. Thank you, Barry. Uh, who wants to ask a question of Linda? Are we, does this, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're good. Yeah. Here there she is, is a, folks. There's a microphone over there. And you have a question. And if you're Nobody close to me, question. I can certainly run right over. Oh, yes. Oh. And there is one over oh. there, too. Yes, there is. I know that gentleman. And he knows how oh, to use hey. a microphone. I know him. I owe him an email. <laughs> oh, you've got it. Oh, I'm not working. We'll call it even. You wrote a book instead. <laughs> So, Linda, I, I, you are a prodigious writer, uh, and I can vouch for the fact that you're a very fast writer. You've just told us you wrote this book over six years. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering, what was it like to carry something with you and work on it for six years? And when you were done, were you like, well, I don't want to have anything. I'm done with that. I'll never do that again. <laughs> or were you say, bring it on? Well, the interesting thing is I made a decision when I sold this book to get into a contract to write a second book <laughs> for the exact, yes, there is a second book for the, for the specific reason that I wanted this to be something that I kept doing because I loved doing it, but it's also a lot of work and it requires a real sort of taking the time to do it. And I wanted to commit to doing another one so that I wouldn't just be like, well, I wanted to write a novel since I was seven and now I wrote one. And so now I can stop because I wanted to keep doing it and I wanted to make myself keep doing it. So I did have a little bit of a sense of like, all right, that's a moment of accomplishment. But I also thought like, no, this isn't necessarily the, you know, do, do I think this is the you know, last thing I ever want to write? Absolutely not. And I thought that I, I wanted to make sure that I pushed myself to do it. So I kind of used a legal obligation to do that. <laughs> so does that mean we'll be back here in 2025? Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that it will be a little sooner than that. And I'm sure so is my publisher. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi there. 
Um, my question is, as you're working on the book and you're continuing to do podcasts, right. how do you go back and forth between your writer hat and your critic hat? Mm-hmm. Like, how do you keep from critiquing what you're writing as you're working on it? Oh, wow. Well, I think everybody critiques what they're writing while they're working on it. Um, I think that's a challenge for everyone, whether you're a professional critic or not. Um, I think the main intersection between working as a critic and and, and writing a, a novel is you come in with certain ideas about what frustrates you in books. Um, you know, I don't like, as I said before, I don't particularly like love stories that start in in very antagonistic or especially kind of like guys that are sexist, which is a really common trope. I hate that. Why would I do that? Well, just go find someone else. Like there's... <laughs> Plenty of fish, as they say. Uh, Plenty of non-sexist fish. Um, So I came in with a lot of stuff I wanted to avoid. What I didn't know, and and the interesting thing is, like, I was not somebody who went into, like, an MFA program or studied fiction writing or or stuff like that. And what I was missing was I, I really, there was a lot about the mechanics of a novel that I didn't know. And so a lot of that I learned through being edited um, really well. So there was a lot that I learned about, like, the pacing of things and how to, um, you know, we talked earlier about this prologue in which you learn that her husband dies um, when she is about to leave him. And in the first draft of the book, that hap- you don't learn that until the middle of the book. You, kn- you know that he has died, and you kind of gradually learn that she wasn't happy, but you don't have that critical piece of information. And there came a moment where I had a conversation with my editor that was like, why am I like, why am I withholding? Like it doesn't need a reveal. And that's the kind of thing that I think that comes with experience. So I was better prepared, I think, through criticism to identify story elements that I liked and didn't like. The mechanics and stuff still takes, you know, I'm I'm still getting better at that. And and I think we'll continue to to work on that for some time. So thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, I was wondering, you spend a lot of time around writers and people yeah. who have written really great books. And I was yeah. wondering if anyone gave you really good pieces of advice while you were going through this process. I called on so many people for so much advice. And it goes all the way back to, like, Rainbow Rowell read a scene from this book when it was 10 pages of writing. Um, and it was just for, like, do you think there's any point in continuing with this? Because I knew her from other stuff. Um, all the way up through when I got done with the book, when I got done with a draft and it was like, how do I get an agent? Like I was very lucky that I knew a bunch of people who recommended agents to me or helped me connect with people all the way up through this April. I was out in LA listening to the recording of the audiobook, which by the way is done by the incredibly great Julia Whalen, who's a wonderful audiobook narrator. Um, and, uh, when I was out there, she organized a dinner for me with, with, um, uh, Jessica Morgan from the Fug Girls, Robin Benway, um, a, this wonderful writer, Robin Lee, um, Julie Buxbaum, like several women she knew through either writing or recording. And they gave me all kinds of advice about kind of how to handle having your book come out. I've been so incredibly lucky to be connected to book people, um, m- many, most of them women who have really absolutely held my hand through this entire process. And that includes Barry and other people that you know through the show, like Margaret Willison and um, some of some of Barry's pals and stuff like that. So tons and tons of great, great help. Thank you. I was wondering, as you're not the first person from the media world to move into writing fiction. I was wondering if there are authors who have made that shift themselves, who have influenced you in terms of inspiring you to make this change, hopefully not permanent, into (laughs) the author mode. Um, I, you know, I wish, I wish that I could say it went that way. I think my desire to write fiction greatly predated any desire to be in the media. So, when I, it's, it was not until this book tour that I realized everyone did not want to write a novel when they were seven years old. Cause I just assumed everyone did. I said, didn't everybody like, especially like anyone who read books when they were little, like, didn't everybody just want to write a novel? No, everyone actually didn't, but I did. Um, I had largely abandoned it by kind of my mid thirties probably. Um, 
and it took a while for it to come back. But so no, I, I honestly, I was much more a person who always wanted to write fiction and then went into the media. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I do think there are some great, there have been some great, um, Taffy Burdesser Ackner has a, a, a book right out right now, a, a first novel out right now called Fleischman is in Trouble, which is a wonderful book. Um, there are a bunch of really intelligent media writers who have been writing fiction and I, I would be lucky to be, you know, inspired by that group of folks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I know you said that the book is not autobiographical, but one thing that stood out about Evie to me was that she talks about how much she loves NPR and she talks about... Yeah. <laughs> there's, talk- a little, there's a little home cooking. <laughs> she talks about TV shows that I know that you've tweeted about and things like that, like yeah. Jane the Virgin, that most people don't find novels. Yeah. Um, so my question is, when you are developing a character, how do you strike a balance between personality characteristics about yourself Versus things that you are developing out of thin air into the yeah. character. Well, honestly, I felt, I felt like the stuff that I that I left in the book was stuff that legitimately seemed like it fit, like it it, it fit for her. She is a person who, um, what she does for a living is she's a transcriber, so she she works with journalists and and researchers and people like that and transcribes long interviews, which is a thing that that people still do, even though some of it is automated now. Um, and so she, to me, is a person who loves to hear other people's stories. That's a kind of a, a quality of hers. So it made sense to me. If you are that kind of person, NPR is an obvious choice. Right. Um, that pledge number is. That pledge <laughs> number is. <laughs> it was weird that the number was in there, I w- thought. Yeah. <laughs> WAMU appreciates your membership. Um, but uh, but, but I, so I, I hoped that the things that I left in there were... Um, things that that fit her, you know. Hi. Um, Hi. You've talked about here and in general about your love of rom-coms. Yes. And I'm just curious if you could share some of, what are some of your favorite rom-com tropes? Oh. Are there any in the book? Ahem. <laughs> I love this two-way. Let's what? do it on uh, Sunday for yeah, weekend let's edition. Do, let's do it. <laughs> um, Favorite rom-com tropes. Um, I have a fondness for, uh, I have a weird fondness for very silly ones sometimes. I tend to like my rom-coms either quite realistic or very silly. So like my love of While You Were Sleeping comes from how incredibly dumb that premise is. (laughs) And I say that with so much adoration. I think I saw that movie six times in theaters. I loved that movie so much. It kind of solidified where I was in rom-com world at that time because it's so ridiculous. It's a thing that I used to write about and refer to as a hum through plot. It's like, you just have to hum loudly to yourself and ignore the plot going by because it's so ridiculous. Um, so I tend to like silly ones like that. I love a good, um, I love a good frank discussion and there's, there's a discussion like that in the, in, in this book. But for example, um, in train wreck with, um, Bill Hader and Amy Schumer, there's a moment where he just kind of says to her, like, here's how I feel. And here's what I think we should do in this very kind of straightforward way. That's very bracing. And cause it's unexpected. That's usually people are afraid to write in a rom-com someone just like announcing that because where do you go from there? Um, so I love a Frank, I love a Frank talk <laughs> like that a lot. Hi. Hi. Um, I finished this book already only because the DC public library had it on the shelf like five days ago. So <gasps> well done. Scandal. DC. Librarians that break the rules or maybe they really love you. Scandal. <laughs> And bookstores are great, too. Um, but later in the book, there's some really wonderful writing about therapy and mental health. And I was wondering oh, if you could you. talk about the decision, the writing that and yeah. where you put it and some of that. Yeah. So let's talk about the fact that love stories are not therapy. Um, she, When I started to write this book, I realized that Evie was a character who, to me, had enough going on in her life that she probably would benefit from some kind of professional assistance. Um, that's just what, what I believe about where she was. She's been... In an emotionally abusive relationship, she's had this very strange, as we talked about, kind of interrupted effort to 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 leave. Um, she's trying to figure out she has a complicated relationship with her mother. She's in the middle of this kind of, is she going to be interested in this guy? Can she get into a new relationship? And I felt like I wanted her to, I wanted her to do something besides meet a man, because that is not how you solve trauma. Um, <laughs> And it's not that trauma is solved, but like that's not how you address trauma is through meeting a new boyfriend. So it was very important to me that she 
have a therapist. And that's another thing that, like, in earlier drafts of the book, those scenes were much longer. <laughs> but the problem with the th writing a therapy scene is that you spend a lot of time in therapy kind of talking about what's already happened to you. <laughs> and eventually my editor was like, here's the thing. <laughs> They've already read the book. <laughs> So they already know all these things that have happened to her. So we had to kind of condense it. But it was really, really important to me um, to have that that um, that aspect in there. Yeah. Thank you. Others? Done. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Of course. But you yes, can do it on the course. microphone like a good radio yeah, person. You have to get up to the. <laughs> this is Petra Mayer, by the way. The excellent Petra Mayer of NPR Books. Of NPR Books. Hi. Hello, so. Um, I wanted to go back to the crying in the shower thing because I read the book sure. also and one of the things that just blew my mind was how like every other page there was some gem of insight into human nature and I was like, oh, I, I, I've acted that way, I know this thing. So mm -hmm. being that you said you took that from something in your own life, has writing this book changed the way that you move through the world and look at the world if everything is possibly material? Is that is that something you think about? Is that a balance you have to strike? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think that I think that those, especially those little things, like those little elements that feel like they could be incorporated into a lot of different stories when you have something like the like the idea of crying in the shower and that it's the easiest way to cry because you no know, kind of it wall just goes away. That's the kind of thing that could belong in a lot of different stories. So yeah, I do. I think I do kind of collect little, like little bits like that. Like a little, mental database. Yeah, <laughs> like little bits of things that maybe I would include in something somewhere. Um, and it does. I do think there becomes. I do think there. You get to a point where you start to see everything as as material. That's probably fair. It's probably fair. I should tell you while I sit next to Linda. It's true. <laughs> she does. Oh, Petra and I sit together. Or hi. Hi. So. On the podcast, yeah. you got obviously this is what it's about. You watch so much TV, movies, Broadway shows. It's true. And you wrote a book and you do the podcast and you write on the website. When did you fit the book in? With I like I was sometimes with you guys with how much TV you're watching. Yeah. I'm like, how do they do that? <laughs> I, I'm impressed. I like hearing about it, but yeah. how do you do it? And they're right. Yeah. About it. And well, talk about it. So one thing is um, I long ago gave up on the idea that I could watch everything. So I only watch certain things. And if you're, you, you can kind of wind up giving people the impression that you are more of a comprehensive TV viewer than you actually are. There's a lot of stuff that I, like, I was not a Game of Thrones person. Um, so I miss things if they're not my thing. So first of all, I don't watch quite as much TV as it sometimes seems like I do. <laughs> um... But another thing is that I started the kind of the, the more intense work on this book. Um, I started in uh, the fall of 2016. I don't know if you remember. It was kind of like a complex time in all of our lives. And um, just because it was a very it was a very heavy kind of election cycle, there's a lot going on. And I had a lot of sort of nervous energy that I needed to kind of a place to put it just because the everything was very kind of the world felt very chaotic. And the thing about writing fiction is that you can uh, control everything that happens. So for me, that was where I just poured a lot of available mental energy. So I think that I put down a lot of the other things that I would do for fun. Mm. And this was sort of, I just, I just poured everything. I would write in the morning. I would write at night. I would write on weekends. The, the times yeah. that you would think um, yes. you could make yourself available. And then from time to time, I would take like a week off. It's what I would do with my vacation is I would take a week off and go write. When oh, I wow. finished the first draft, I actually took a week off and just went far away wow. to, to complete that first draft. So it was a combination of squeezing it in around work and getting away from work. It was a lot. <laughs> How did I do that? That's a good question. Can I ask you one more? Yeah. Um, I, this is something I did want to bring up. This is going to feel like a weird ender. So sure. somebody come up with something more appropriate to this as we. Um, but uh, one of the things, because it is romantic, so romantic things happen. Mm -hmm. um, I There's like a very, very um, careful, it appears to me, to be writing around consent. Yes, you're right. <laughs> oh my you God. Are yes. You are the first person who has asked me about it. A plus student. You are right. <laughs> you are right. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I just wondered yeah. about how that. Very intentional. Limped. Very uh -huh. intentional. Um, what I was trying to challenge myself to do was write um, 
a, affirmative, enthusiastic consent that didn't feel um, that didn't feel sort of uh, bureaucratic right. in a way. Yeah. It's sexy. That as would all feel, get out. That would feel like it could be a normal part of, mm-hmm. and particularly. If somebody, if if you sort of, because as I was saying before, I like a frank conversation. If you have a frank conversation and it kind of doesn't happen right then, what I don't like is I don't want the person who has announced themselves to then just come back and back and back and back and be sort of just pushing and pushing and uh-huh. pushing. So I wanted there to be a way to say, okay, then it will be your responsibility to announce your enthusiastic consent if you change your mind. Hmm. So it is absolutely that's intentional. I should have known you would be the first person who would ask me about it. Um, but yes, that was, a, that was a very important thing to me. And I, that was, to some degree, just sort of a personal challenge. Uh-huh. I was just curious about whether, um, whether I could put it's, it in the book. It reads like it, is a, it should be required reading. And I Excellent. Think, Let's um, do that. In that. <laughs> yeah. It's required, guys. We're going to be here all night. Sorry. It's going to be super fun. It's required. Um, But it is because it's still also romantic and there are still these, you know, there are still people who are attracted and attractive and all of these, Mm -hmm. you know, and it is still. But it also is a kind of you've also made it. I think you've built in the comedy as well, which is, you know, so. Anyway, I that was I'm glad so you liked the book, Barry. I did. I would have been so bummed if you didn't. I mean, I keep saying this, but I really did. I forgot you had written it within like five pages, which is hard to do when you're reading like a good friend's book. Yeah. You know, well, so I appreciate that's it. like I'm that's glad. the highest praise I'm I can very give. Glad. Um, when you do you think, well, I mean, I know you got a second novel up yeah. your sleeve. Yeah. Um, do are we bye bye every day? What's ha- I'm sorry, that's I have to. This question. is like a what no, what happens? I, who so can I we stay in Maine? There's a couple questions, right? One is, do you ever revisit these characters again? One is, do you ever revisit this world again? Mm-hmm. And one is, do you ever revisit this feel again? Sort of yeah. like this is it just a matter of your sensibility? Um, I think that, um, all of the answers to those things are probably a little bit up in the air. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think there's definitely, these are characters that I love. I don't know that I have another story about these particular mm-hmm. people. Um, but there are, you know, ancillary characters in the book. You never know. And something might spark with with one of those folks. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we'll see. I'm not sure. But as for feel, I mean, like, are you, I mean, I just like, do you, can you imagine yourself? Like, is there a mystery up your sleeve or a... That's a um, great question. I think it's like unlikely. Or, I think it's unlikely that I will swerve too madly mm-hmm. with, this, with a second book. Mm-hmm. I think I might swerve more madly with a third book. Mm-hmm. Ooh, um, this is great. I just great. kind of want to get. This is going so well. I kind of want to get. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm still, as I said, there's still a lot that I'm that I'm learning about mm-hmm. about how to make a make a novel happen mm-hmm. and. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking to make it any harder than than it otherwise would be by like wildly changing direction. But mm-hmm. we'll see. You never know. I mean, I think I, I get asked a lot about writing a YA book. Yeah, um, I this you know, um, and this by the way feels like you know, this, I would happily give this to a 16, 17, yeah, 18 year Yeah, it's old. not an incredibly like it has. He's a professional, former professional athlete, so he does swear a, some, but um, it's not an incredibly like explicit book at all no I wouldn't want to write that stuff like I like writing about a good meal but I don't necessarily want to write about the mechanics of chewing that's like <laughs> sort of my <laughs> sort yeah of my, not, like, not 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 so like avoid the saliva how romantically explicit it is or isn't are there parts of the of um of Evie that beca- was this all it was at was Evie always Evie did it start it, it was always itself yeah, what do like you Like, this book was always this book. You didn't start out writing a different story. No, it was I, always I actually, this. it was originally two books. I originally had an idea about a widow and oh, an idea about a baseball right. player. And it was kind of like, the, neither one of them really had a, I didn't kind of have a, a forward direction. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I put them in the same house together, they sort of were in in, in conversation, uh-huh. you know, both literally and, and I think figuratively those stories were in, in dialogue with each so other. So there's not like cutting room floor material that's going to... Well, I mean, right. there's like 300 pages of stuff my editor wisely cut, but I was talking Non-fiction about Non-fiction book night. about the yips? Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about this last night. It's like somebody said to me at an event I was at last night, they said, well, you know, could it, could it ever be... Because I talked about how much I cut mm-hmm. and they said, you know, but it could be like DVD extras. And I was like, if you ever watch the deleted scenes on a DVD... Mm-hmm. There's you a 
usually you say, I understand why they deleted that. <laughs> um, so there's a good reason most of it was cut. Right, right. Thank you, uh, Mary. Thank you, Linda. This was so much fun. Fantastic. I could keep going, but so I think we probably yeah. people want to. You guys, this is such a lovely book. Thank you, you so much. Read it. Oh my God.